2013, when the Business Network was founded, um, we have now grown to a national organization, uh, specifically focused on growing offshore wind across the country. We do three things. We advocate and support the development of policies to promote offshore wind uh, at the state level and at the federal level. We are focused on building out the U.S. offshore wind supply chain through education and partnering. Uh, we do a lot of technical education. We also do a lot of partnering local companies with European experts specifically. And I think Matt will tell you a little bit about that because Matt is actually a member of our organization and has been to some of our technical conferences as well has been introduced to numerous European firms to help build capacity and expertise within his own business. So that's who we are. I should say one other thing. We're the only national organization, actually the only organization in the United States that's solely focused on offshore wind. Um, there are other organizations, but they focus on land-based and offshore, or they focus on other marine and renewable energy technologies. We are solely focused on one uh, clean energy technology, offshore wind. We do it 24-7, 365. So I like to say now that we are the market experts on offshore wind in this country. Um, these are some of our business network members. I think when I spoke, we probably had 25 organizations involved. We're now well over 150. We have international uh, companies as well as local businesses, as well as the one-man uh, firm in, in the Port of Baltimore that's a, a ship repair company. So we go from multi-billion dollar companies to, um, to very local companies, as well as many members down here in the Lower Eastern Shore. So the world market for offshore wind will double by 2020. Uh, we are seeing activity not just in Europe anymore, we're seeing it in Asia and in India. So we are seeing a lot of uh, countries uh, embrace offshore wind. Uh, we have 10 European countries that are using offshore wind, have it deployed, that are powering 13 million homes. And by 2030, we expect China to have one-third of the offshore wind market. Why is this happening? The price is dropping dramatically. Uh, when we started advocating for the offshore wind bill in Maryland in 2013, the price point we figured was 21 cents a kilowatt hour. As you all know, that's pretty high. Um, but what we've seen in Europe in a very, very short time frame is we've seen actual contracts at zero subsidy. So the highest point, price point we have now in Europe is 5.5 cents. So it does vary between 5.5 cents and nothing, so grid parity. So that's what we're seeing. And why are we seeing that? We're seeing it for a couple reasons. One is scale. Um, we've talked, they have about 13 gigawatts of offshore wind deployed off their coast or will have it deployed off their coast. They have a mature supply chain and they, we've also made great technological advances. Uh, when we were talking about offshore wind in 2013, we were talking about a 3.5 megawatt machine. Now we're talking about an 8-point megawatt and going up to 15 megawatts. These things are huge. And the reason why they're, the fact that they're huge means that they have to be manufactured local. So that means that it does create jobs. And what we are seeing is that Europe now supports 96,000 jobs in the offshore wind industry. This is our potential. This is us, on the, this is just the East Coast. So from essentially Washington DC all the way up to Massachusetts, this is our power load. You can see that one third of the US population is concentrated along this coastline. So it's really hard to get renewable energy from the Midwest or solar on all of those homes to power that much need. So what we do have is we have really great wind speeds and shallow water close to um, our greatest demand, our greatest energy need. So we have 13 wind energy areas leased off the United States now, mostly from Maine down to North Carolina. Um, that represents 15 gigawatts of offshore wind. Now you remember I said in Europe they have about 13 gigawatts. So already our potential is greater than what Europe has and they're supporting 96,000 jobs with that. We have, um, <clears throat> we have seen a cost and reduction of energy by 32%, which I told you about. We have 
I think one of the biggest things that came out of Maryland in this year was that the offshore wind industry had a price point set. So without one commercial scale development in the water, we were already at 13 cents a kilowatt hour. So we saw a decrease of almost nine cents without doing one thing. Um, we do have one project in the water now um, many of you may have heard of the Block Island Project. It's a 30 megawatt project uh, that sits in state waters off of Rhode Island. I highly encourage you all to go and see it. Um, I, my family did a tour of it this summer. It's beautiful. It's, it's just gorgeous. Then we have another project uh, permitted and approved and financed off of Long Island for 90 megawatts. Then you all heard in May the Maryland Public Service Commission announced that they would fund 368 megawatts of offshore wind uh, off of Maryland. And then soon, uh, December 20th, the RFPs in Massachusetts are closing for 800 megawatts of offshore wind. Um, those will be announced in April or May of 2018. Uh, Massachusetts also has legislation to take another 800 megawatts of offshore wind. So 1,600 megawatts in total will be what Massachusetts will procure. Massa New York has made a commitment for 2,400 megawatts. The new governor in New Jersey, when he takes office in January, will make a commitment for 3,500 megawatts. So together, if you aggregate that, we have a pipeline of 5.46 gigawatts of offshore wind. As I said, offshore wind is here. It presents a significant opportunity in these sectors, planning, manufacturing, assembly, build out, that's just regular construction, both on, on on land construction and offshore construction, deployment, we're talking about vessels, vessel operators, lots of subsea um, work, and then obviously operations and maintenance, which this area will be able to take advantage of, and I know that Matt will talk about in a minute. We've done a um, sort of a, a list of where we think the opportunities lie, um, based on towers, blades, generators, and jackets foundations what the investments required, what are some of the barriers are. I know you can't read this, but I'd be more than happy to send this around. So we are looking at what does it take to get into the supply chain? What does it take to get into the market? And we are here to help you with that. So these are some of our members. As I said, we have over 150 now. You can see where they are um, in the permitting or, or in the supply chain specifically. This is really where the U.S. has its expertise and where the expertise lies. But these are the gaps that we have in the supply chain. Obviously, we don't have a nacelle factory. We don't have blade manufacturing. I know that blade manufacturing was talked about in Salisbury a while ago. So that presents a great opportunity. Cable, cable manufacturing, cable storage. That's another area that we're looking at very closely for Maryland. Vessels, um, building vessels, bringing shipbuilding back to the U.S., to Maryland as a whole for crew transfer vessels. And then finally, the O&M, the operations and maintenance, the workforce training, and then all of the secondary and tertiary businesses that will benefit from all of the O&M work that's going to be done, done, as well as some of the main manufacturing. So we're talking about catering and hotels and transportation services. So there's a lots and lots of uh, job creation, and we say for every one job that's created in O&M, seven jobs are created um, for that one job. So you can imagine where, where, how we see this multiplier going. And with that, I'll turn it over to Matt and let you talk about specifically Maryland. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Matt Drew. Uh, I'm with uh, AWB Engineers. I'm the Executive Vice President with AWB Engineers. Uh, I'm also a member of the Lower Shore Wind Coalition, um, and we'll, um, a number of other members of uh, Lower Shore Wind are here today. Uh, so if you have any questions after this meeting and you can't talk to me or Liz, I think there's a number of other people in the audience that might be able to help out. So um, what I'm going to talk today, Liz painted a great picture of what's happening on a national basis. What I'm going to be talking today uh, is what's uh, happening, what the opportunities are specifically for Maryland. So in Maryland, Liz mentioned 2013, a quick history lesson, um, the Maryland State Legislature passed uh, the Offshore Renewable Energy Cre um, Credit Act, um, and it provided for um, up to 250 megawatts of power um, to, be, um, to be, in essence, subsidized through 
uh, incentives um, in the state. Um, a request went out for uh, bids. Uh, the Public Service Commission re renewed, reviewed two proposals, and um, they actually made a very, very bold step uh, in May of 2017. Um, they funded um, more than 250 megawatts. They actually funded um, 358 megawatts in two separate proposals that were received. So, that, so the Public Service Commission in Maryland uh, see, saw this as a, as a very, very interesting opportunity, uh, not only for uh, renewable energy, but in their um, approval, they also made a very, very bold step because they see this as an opportunity for economic um, uh, development in the state and most importantly, jobs. Um, there are two projects that were approved. One is by a company called U.S. Wind. U.S. Wind um, proposes to put in 31 8 megawatt turbines. They would complete this, uh, their schedule, uh, uh, published schedule right now is January of 2020. Um, this would be the project that many of you have probably heard about that would be directly um, east of, of uh, the inlet at Ocean City, Maryland. Um, and they would make their grid connection at the uh, Indian River power plant that's in Delaware. The second project that was approved is by a company called Skipjack. Uh, Skipjack's parent company is uh, Deepwater Energy. And um, if, you, if you saw that um, cheesy selfie that I had in the very first slide, in the background was um, one of the five Block Island wind turbines that Liz spoke of that was the first offshore wind project for the United States. Um, that was a project that was first developed by Deepwater. So, so the names become confusing after a while, but Deepwater's parent company is the parent company that's doing the Skipjack project, which is the second project for Maryland. Um, interesting uh, point of fact, the, the, the Skipjack project is actually more closely off the coast of Delaware, but it's, it's taking advantage of the Maryland PSC um, incentive program and the OREX provided by that. So, so it's considered to be part of the Maryland project. Both these projects, by the way, are, are in, the, in federal waters. So these outlines that you see are uh, areas that were designated by uh, the federal government about uh, probably five plus years ago. They were bid on by the developers. And so if you, if you think of it from a, from a uh, landlord leasing standpoint, um, these are the tenants that in essence are going to occupy these, um, these, uh, these leased areas. Um, for both projects, and this is the part where uh, the Public Service Commission for Maryland, I think, made a very, very bold step. Um, they not only approved both the developers' proposals for producing power, but they set some requirements in place that um, we all as Marylanders are going to benefit from. Um, the biggest one is that both of the projects have to demonstrate a net economic benefit to the citizens of Maryland. So uh, for both of the projects, they have a minimum amount of dollar value that has to return back to the state. Um, they have a minimum number of jobs that they have to create. Um, and they have some specific investments that they have to make as well. Um, they have to invest $12 million in uh, funding for business development grants uh, through the Maryland Energy Administration. They have to create 2,211 full-time positions during the development and construction phase. And they have to create 2,766 full-time positions once the construction is complete when we go into the operations phase. So the operations phase if you think about this in terms of probably three to four years to build some of these projects, but then once they're in operation, they're going to have a lifespan of at least 20 years. So um, all told, you've got um, over 4,500 jobs that are going to be created as a result of this. And that's, that's the pipeline that, that um, when Liz talked about the 90,000 plus jobs that are, are in place today in Europe, this is the pipeline of jobs that the, that the PSC wants to see happen in Maryland. So that's why they made these requirements of the developers. Um, in addition, the Public Service Commission required that there'll be a marshalling port in Baltimore, Maryland. So all the components that have to be made somewhere else, they're very, very large, and there's no factories that create them today. Uh, for the first, some of these first projects, a lot of components are going to be made in Europe, brought into Baltimore. They'll have to be marshaled in Baltimore. Public Service Commission also made a requirement. This is not a nice to do, this is a shall. They must do the operations and maintenance operations in Ocean City, Maryland. Um, and then lastly, they required that the permanent operations center be located in Maryland. Um, longer vision, they're requiring that both of the developers invest a total of $76 million in steel fabricating um, businesses. 
as well as $39 million in uh, Trade Point Atlantic or a comparable Maryland port. So what both of those requirements are saying is that we don't just want um, the jobs that are associated just with these two Maryland projects. They have a longer vision in mind. And their vision is that they want um, the state of Maryland to become a hub for manufacturing so that um, as we build out this first, um, Liz talked about five gigawatts. So basically we're only talking about 0.3 gigawatts of these first Maryland projects. They're very small from a power standpoint, but when we then build out the next gigawatt and the, the fourth gigawatt and the 10th gigawatt, we want to see um, projects or components that are being made in Maryland go into those projects as well. So that's what this investment is speaking to. Um, and so just to kind of wrap it all up, why did they require all of these things? Well, if you look at this map, and this is similar to a map that Liz um, had, um, where you see the blue dot, that's where we're sitting today in Salisbury, Maryland. You can see the squiggly lines just to the right where the two uh, Maryland wind energy areas but then starting in Massachusetts and going all the way down to South Carolina, there are many other um, sites that have already been carved out um, that, are, that are available for development. So, and we're right in the center of all that. So we, we stand to, to have a great opportunity today um, if we position ourselves right, right and we, we address these first two projects that are, for all intents and purposes, placed in our lap. Um, if, if we take advantage of this opportunity, we can not only serve the, the, the beginning projects for Maryland, but we can create a new industry um, in our country that would be based here in Maryland. Um, quick thing, a uh, quick plug on Lower Shore Wind. We're a, a group of uh, public and private organizations that are looking to create opportunities to create this supply chain that I keep talking about uh, for Worcester, Wacomico, and Somerset counties. Um, we want to create economic opportunities for the Eastern Shore, and we are um, we are trying to advocate local resources uh, to put people in contact with the developers and suppliers for offshore wind. Um, we've got some, uh, and this is not just an academic exercise for us, there are some active business opportunities that are, that are being worked on right now in the areas of metal fabrication, uh, panel and wiring harnesses, as well as uh, developing the operations and maintenance facility. Um, Quick talk about the maybe the 800-pound grill in the room because I've been asked a lot of questions about this. Um, in terms of Ocean City, there's a lot of questions with the uh, questions of local support uh, from um, from the community and questions about what this might mean for for their economy. So I'd like to speak specifically about the operations and maintenance center because if you remember from the list of requirements that I talked about earlier, the operations and maintenance center can't be located in. Indian River. It can't be located in Chincoteague. It has to be located in Ocean City, Maryland. So, so there's some very, very um, great opportunities that I think it's important for um, those who are concerned about put the, the, the thought of any potential um, degradation to the economy, that this really does have some huge benefits that everybody just needs to keep in mind. Um, so locally, um, the Operations and Maintenance Center, and so, so just to take a step back, once the projects are built, um, there will be an ongoing need day in, day out to do things as small as drive out to the wind farm and replace a fuse to as big as, oh my gosh, we just had a lightning strike that took out one of the blades and we have to replace it. So, so this operations and maintenance component is a 24 hour a day, seven day a week, 20 year operation that will be happening. Um, in doing that, there's going to be between 40 and 60 direct full-time positions that will be created that will work in Ocean City, Maryland. The entire business has a $36 million per year for 20-year impact. So when Liz talked about the, um, the, the value chain of, of what it takes to build a wind farm, in round terms, if, um, if, for, for, if, if you had $3 that it cost you to build a wind farm, one dollar of the three dollars is the the turbine blades and the tower the second dollar is the infrastructure to get foundations and the cabling to plug that tower in the third dollar so one third of all the costs of the wind farm is in the operations and maintenance phase so so it's a very very huge economic component that may not be in the front of everybody's mind but has a huge impact on on the community 
The other thing that will happen for the, city, the town of Ocean City is that as a result of the operations and maintenance, there's going to be an increased level of marine services that are going to be required. So this is beside from the technicians and the, the, the engineers who have to maintain these, um, these turbines, there's going to be a whole secondary business of, if you think about it, it's going to be the school bus route that picks people up every day and takes them out to the wind turbines. There's going to be um, three crew transfer vessels that will be built. Um, each one of those is a, is a $4 million investment. Um, those crew transfer vessels will be operated with local crews. Um, and not only that, they're actually going to be built here in the state of Maryland. So again, providing that net, e net economic benefit to the citizens of Maryland. And then lastly, for the, for the folks in Ocean City, um, anybody who's run a, a vessel in and out of the inlet at Ocean City knows that it can be treacherous at times. There's been a lot of silting in um, and keeping a, a channel way dredge to get out to the ocean in Ocean City is, is very, very difficult. Having one more need for um, reliable marine services and traffic in and out of that inlet will help increase uh, the, the request for dredging in Ocean City and allow um, a, a stronger argument on behalf of the town for bringing more federal funding in. Um, and then the last thing is um, we see the, uh, the um, wind farms actually as a benefit to tourism. Um, there's been um, a lot of talk around the Block Island project about how the structures that are in the water become very, very attractive for those who are um, interested in recreational fishing. Um, so having these structures in place and the marine life that's associated with them will actually um, help boost recreational fishing in this area. Um, there's a lot of, uh, of um, seaside tourist communities that are in Europe that have seen an increase in tourism solely for the fact that there are a lot of people that then become interested in going out and, as Liz described, taking their family and, and going out and seeing what the wind farms look like. So there's a benefit to create a brand new um, uh, destination for Ocean City um, as a tourist destination for uh, wind energy. And then lastly, I think this sends a very, very strong message um, that Ocean City is very committed to, um, that they're a community that's interested in seeing a sustainable future. There's a couple of pieces of legislation, thank you, that are being considered right now just to um, um, put this out there as well. Um, one is a, uh, a, a proposed um, restriction that, uh, that um, Representative Harris has, has promulgated that would restrict um, funding for um, offshore wind at the federal level um, to nothing closer than 24 nautical miles from shore. That if that restriction happens, it would, um, it would completely um, uh, bar any development for the southern wind, wind farm area, so that's the U.S. wind area, and it would cut the, uh, the northern wind area, the, the uh, skipjack area, uh, by about two-thirds. So um, we're hoping that that, that goes away. All indications are is that it it's probably doesn't have much chance for success with that, but that is is pending. And likewise, on the the slide on the right, there's also some uh, proposed uh, legislation at the uh, federal level to create a mid-Atlantic fairway, um, which uh, um, would be part of a Coast Guard appropriations bill. And again, this would cut in half the U.S. wind area and probably make uh, their their development uh, very very difficult to do as well. So. Um, so not to end on a downer, um, one thing I would like to leave you with is that um, I, I spoke about one of the funding requirements that both the developers have, which is to create a business development fund that's going to be um, administered through the Maryland Energy Administration. Um, so the Maryland Energy Administration has uh, received um, a number of applications for uh, grants for business development funds. And um, I, I can't say anything specifically, but I am excited to say that uh, by January of next year, there are going to be two local Salisbury businesses that have made application and will be um, receiving grants from this uh, wind energy fund. So, um, so this is really happening. This is not just an academic exercise. Um, there are businesses that are, that are pursuing this and, um, and, and trying to bring this to our state. So thank you very much.